Hello, everybody. Uh, we are in a new session of our Dusty webinars, and today we have uh, the I have the pleasure I uh, have the pleasure to present uh, to Isaac uh, Triguero, a uh, researcher that he is uh, widely known here at the University of uh, Granada because he studied here his PhD, and then he continued his research in the uh, Newcastle University. Today. Is going to present uh, to talk uh, about meta learning approaches for few shot image classification. I know that uh, we will enjoy the talk of uh, Isaac, and Isaac, the time is yours okay, when you want. All right, very, very good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I should say probably thank you, Eugenio, for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, but joking aside, it's been already more than seven, eight months, I think, since I came back to Granada. I think this talk was kind of long overdue already. Um, because I think most of you will not know me because I was here like 10 years ago before I left. Um, so I thought that rather than just starting with the talk directly in which I'm gonna be talking about few shot learning, I'm gonna put just one single slide in which I will be just summarizing very, very briefly uh, kind of my research interest and what I do normally in my research, right? So since I started my journey as a researcher. I've been doing quite a lot of data pre-processing and my expertise is on the big data pre-processing side of things. So that means I've been doing feature selection, uh, instance uh, reduction, selection, generation, and dealing with imbalanced learning and also quite a bit on semi-supervised learning and other topics. And in all of them, somehow, the idea of computational intelligence has been always there. And that is uh, fuzzy logic, evolutionary algorithms, deep learning, and so forth. And that's what I started doing my research when I did my PhD. And then when I moved to um, Europe and then uh, after to the University of Nottingham, Eugenio, not Newcastle. Um, so when I went to Nottingham, uh, what I've been doing there is more application side of things, right? So I've been doing quite a few collaborations with um, the Imperial College on healthcare. And I've done uh, a lot of work with industry in the energy sector with E.ON, which is kind of the Iberdrola of the UK and Germany. And I've been working also quite a lot with Unilever making ice cream. Um, so all this Magnum and all this stuff is thanks to me. No, it's not. But that's the kind of research I've been doing, dealing with a lot of devices connected and looking at time series data type of thing. And since I came back, I'm heading towards a few different goals, which I have started somehow which is all about sustainability, green AI, and a bit more general purpose AI, which is kind of the topic of this talk today. So what do I want to talk about in the next three hours? Is it three hours, Eugenio? Or I don't know if people normally interact, but I do like interacting with people. So feel free to say anything during my talk if you need to. Uh, but hopefully in the next 45 minutes, I will be able to go through a bit of motivation as to why few shot learning, introducing few shot learning, and some canonical examples. So what I try to do is try to make sure that everybody's on the same page before I start talking about the contributions we've been doing in the last three, four years to the topic. Um, it's been a bit difficult because machine learning and few shot learning, they differ quite a bit um, in the way we address uh, the topic, let's say. So I've been trying to come up with enough background for everybody to follow what I do here. If you already know about few shot learning, you will probably find the first half an hour of the talk quite boring. So please bear with me until the end in which I talk about the contributions that I've been uh, doing with my students. So, so a little bit of motivation. Why are we talking about this today? What is future learning? I will come back to that question itself. But what I wanted to uh, let you know is that somehow that idea of artificial, artificial general intelligence, which is the idea of a machine that can somehow perform any task that a human could do in the same way or even better has remained to be an aspiration, let's say. Uh, but well, somehow it may have become a little bit more real now with ChatGPT, everybody's talking about it. But in my personal opinion, there is still a little bit far from achieving that kind of general intelligence, right? But we are heading towards that general purpose AI. So something that could be more flexible, yeah? And somehow, two of the main pillars of artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning and optimization, they have been already somehow interacting with each other to try to achieve that kind of more 
general intelligence. So somehow at the moment, we are still in need. So they still need people like us, data scientists, or people with a background in artificial intelligence to be able to design the algorithms and to fine tune the algorithms. Something you might be familiar with um, in the idea of using machine learning and optimization together is for example, for uh, a given algorithm, we can optimize its parameter, right? So you might have heard of using evolutionary algorithms, for example, a TSO algorithm to optimize the parameters, the hyperparameters of another algorithm. And that algorithm could be, well, a machine learning algorithm, or it could be another optimization algorithm. And that's what we are uh, putting in this picture here as the fourth connection, which is optimization to improve optimization. You might have kind of crossed the idea of optimizing or improving machine learning by means of optimization techniques, right? Hyperparameter tuning is probably one of the most clear examples, but there is many other, uh, there are many other situations like for example, instance selection in which we have been using optimization techniques to improve uh, machine learning. It is also possible to find ideas of machine learning to improve optimization. And if you're not so familiar with that, maybe if I talk to you about the topic of hyperheuristics, you might have kind of crossed the idea of using machine learning to improve an optimization algorithm that is performing a search, which is performing basically uh, an optimization, right? So these three are quite, let's say, well-known. And the last one, which is kind of somehow uh, the topic of this talk is about using machine learning to improve uh, machine learning. And the goal of doing so is normally to you know, deal with that lack of generalization that we might have if we need to perform on anything that we haven't seen before. And more importantly, I think the main thing why this is becoming something interesting is that we do have loads of data, but sometimes we need to extract that data, we need label data, and that's not always the case, right? So that's what we are gonna be dealing with, the use of machine learning to machine learning to improve it, right? And that's what we are um, interested in in this talk. Within that, in the survey that we put together at the beginning of my student's uh, song PhD, well, we categorize that, let's say, uh, particular interaction machine learning to machine learning. And we could be talking, for example, about which algorithm is best, right? So that sounds more like auto machine learning, right? Or which parameters we should give to a particular method, right? But it's also useful to improve how you train a model. For example, you could do surrogate models, you could do adaptive parameters and so forth, or decide which components of an algorithm are useful. And more importantly, and maybe becoming most of a, let's say a trending topic is the idea of transferring knowledge. And when we talk about transfer knowledge, we might be talking about two different things. We might be just simply talking about transfer knowledge across tasks, but also trying to learn some meta knowledge that could be common to a class of tasks, right? And that's kind of, kind of somehow where we are heading in this talk when I later introduce what future learning actually is. So I just wanted to show you there before we move on to future learning, um, some of the most active fields of this general purpose AI. One of them is, of course, auto machine learning. And you might be familiar with AutoWake Up, for example, which is all about really Bayesian optimization to determine which algorithm is best and the hyperparameters. You might have heard of uh, auto scikit learn, which is a complete different philosophy. This is more meta learning, as similar to what we do here today in future learning. Um, you might have also kind of crossed autogluon, which to my understanding is the best performing uh, auto machine learning platform that we've got right now uh, available to us when it comes to tabular data though. And that is actually based on stacking, based on ensembles uh, mostly, right? But there are many other places in which that general purpose AI can be found. You can, may find this when we talk about recommender systems. Um, we will also find it today when we talk about few zero shot uh, learning. All right, hopefully you're still there with me. It's 420, so that was kind of okay. So I'm gonna now go and move on, on to 
few-shot learning, right? So what is few-shot learning? This is just one of those um, examples in which we want to think more like a human do, right? So the thing is, we as humans, we are actually real good at recognizing new object classes, right? So you, for example, give, um, you, you show your kid, for example, what the cat looks like. You have one cat at home, and then they will see other breeds of that same cat, of, of a cat, and they will quickly actually say, yeah, that's a cat, right? And, and they will be able to distinguish a cat or a dog just by seeing a few examples. You don't have to see all the breeds to actually somehow know, hey, that's a cat, that's a dog, right? It might happen, however, that if they see, for example, a lion or, or something like, or a leopard, they might think it's a cat, yeah? Because they're more similar to a cat if they don't know what that particular class is, right? But in machine learning, the main problem we have is to be able to learn that, we are forced to provide basically thousands of examples to achieve a similar performance, right? And the goal of few shot learning is to be able to classify new data having seen only a few training examples, right? So in the extreme case, basically, we are talking about one example of each class, right? And that's what we call one shot learning. The main problem is we cannot train just a classifier using conventional methods here, right? So any modern classification algorithm will depend on far more parameters than there are that there are training examples. So it will generalize poorly. So here you've got an example of what the training set of a few shot learning, in this case, few shot image classification would look like. So in the training set, we've got five classes. We've got something there, a dog actually looking backward. We've got something here, right, a pot, and we've got some lions. And then in the test, you've got to classify different instances, but they look quite different actually from those in the training set, right? The application of this is actually quite widely. Uh, you might actually come across future learning um, when you are trying to recognize new species, right? Or anything like that, or for a recommender system, right? To deal with new users. Uh, but in practice, the way I understand future learning is that it's useful when it's difficult to get training examples, right? That are difficult to find. For example, in the case of rare diseases, right? Or where the cost of labeling the data is very high. And when I'm telling you this, you might be thinking, hey, Isaac, isn't that the objective of many other topics like semi-supervised learning or dealing with imbalanced data, for example. Somehow, yes, but the approach you will see quickly that is quite, quite different, right? So um, here we do not, we assume very, very few data, but at the same time, we're gonna assume we've got some external data from which we can learn like a human actually do. Here you can see different research fields in which this is applied in computer vision, which is kind of the topic of the talk today. Uh, we can see a lot of images and classification of images is a big topic, but also in natural language processing. I'm not an expert in there, but I can tell you GPT-3 kind of popularized this idea of future learning because we can learn kind of what you see in this picture, which is with very few examples of translation. This is the task we want to perform, translate English to French. And we've got a few examples and what you expect the method to do is to actually be able to translate it, right? So it is definitely possible. I'm not an expert on that. So please don't ask me, but I believe Eugenio actually is the expert on natural language processing. So he would be happy to take uh, any questions there. Anyway, um, so moving a little bit more on future learning, before we make a start, I need to introduce some key terminology. Um, so when we talk about future learning, we're gonna say we've got K samples of a given class. So if I say one shot learning, I mean, I only have one sample of one particular class. In here, in this example, we've got two cats, right? And that's what we're gonna use to train. So we're gonna call, we're gonna call this two shots learning, right? So that's how we call it. And then we also distinguish the problem based on the number of classes we are trying to be able to classify. In this example, we've got the cat, we've got the lamb, and we've got the pig. So here is a three-way, two-shot, few-shot learning classification, right? So at the stream, 
we normally have what we call one shot learning, which would be K equal one, and we've got a number of classes. You might be thinking having more classes is even more difficult, but sometimes it's actually not, as you will see later on. Ho hopefully you will understand why I say that. But also there is something real funny uh, that is called zero shot learning. Um, and what is that? Learning without any data points per se. So you will not have anything to learn from. Well, you do. You do have some meta information from which you can learn. That meta information will be information about the classes you expect to find in the test set, but you have never seen an actual image of a cat, for example, but I tell you how it looks like. An example, a classical example to understand how zero shot learning actually works is let's say you've seen a horse, you know what a horse looked like, but you never seen zebra, right? So then I tell you, hey, a zebra looks very much like a horse, but they, they are black and, and they have white stripes, yeah? So if I tell you that, whenever you see a zebra and you see, oh, that looks like a horse, but it has that meta information I've given you, you will be able to perform that classification, right? So that is kind of what zero short learning is about, although I don't do much of that today, right? So I don't see anyone, but hopefully you're still there and I'm not talking to myself here at uh, the office. So a bit more of terminology that I need you to bear in mind throughout the entire talk. Um, we are gonna be learning in task, right? A task includes N classes. So it's an N way K shot learning. And what we have is that information to train. And this information only is what we use to train. And that's what we call the support set, right? Very much our training set in machine learning. And then we've got the query set. And that query set is what we normally call the test set in machine learning. But why do they change the names and the terminology? We will see it later, but it makes sense because we are not gonna learn from one single task. We are learning from more tasks and it's complicated to distinguish between the training and the test in the way we traditionally do in machine learning. So how do we deal with this? I want you to think just for a sec, if you're given this and I tell you, you need to come up with a classifier that is able to learn from only two samples here of each class and be able to classify, how will you do it? And for me, when, well, my student came to me and introduced this problem to me, I thought, wait, what do we do if we have very few data? what kind of classifiers we can actually use. If you were to use anything parametric, probably will not work. What you need is something non-parametric typically, right? So in which, you know, non-parametric models will work really well with low data, right? Uh, with low amounts of data. And some people actually may say, hey, why don't you use the k nearest neighbor, right? And I would say, yeah, it's not a bad shout, not at all, it's a good thing. The problem is, well, how do you learn that good feature representation? How do you compute the distances, right? But the idea of K and N, the idea of K nearest neighbor is actually really useful um, to deal with this. And some authors actually, the ones in this book down here, they actually say K nearest neighbor is kind of, you know, the most basic baseline you can define to deal with one shot or few shot learning classification. Additionally, you might be thinking, yeah, I was thinking of KNN, but before doing any KNN at all, I think the main thing to do is to, you know, increase the amount of training data we have. That's what we've been doing forever in imbalanced classification or semi-supervised learning or anything like that. Yeah. So you might be thinking of using some augmentation techniques like rotation, scaling, flipping, core manipulation, or anything like that. But the problem with that is that they will still be way too similar. So you're not gonna be able to train well. You're gonna end up actually overfitting your data set. So then you might be thinking, but Isaac, you said this is more like learning like a human does. And a human doesn't learn just one single task. We are learning many things. We are learning from more data, but it's not data specifically, specifically for that task. It's much more than that. And that's when the idea of using some similar data sets comes to place, right? And that's what we normally call the base class data. You might be thinking, okay, okay, I think I know what this is. What you're going to do is to pre-train a big network or mini image net. And then when it comes down to do a different task, 
you start off from those parameters, from those weights, and that will help. And as I will show you in a second, that will not really work well, actually. Uh, but that's kind of the direction we are heading. And what we, where we're heading is more of a meta-learning um, type of thing, right? In which we will see how to learn in a way that we can actually use external data uh, nicely, right? So I will come back to what meta-learning actually is in a second, but that's kind of the idea is we're going to use external data sets to learn first before learning how to solve a particular task. Coming back to pre-training, how will you do it? Maybe what you were thinking is if we were to take mini image net, for example, as a data set in here, you might be thinking, all right, let's do a multi-class classification problem. We learn all of it. They, they do not have the same classes, right? So we're not cheating here. We're actually doing things right. So the classes you are exploring here, they were not in the future learning task. We pre-learn here and we get some weights and then we pass those weights to the fine tuning stage that we would do only and exclusively with these five images for that one shot learning task. The problem with that is that it's expected not to perform really well. Why? Because the fine tuning will not work really well, right? We will see in a minute, actually one of the ideas is in, in future learning is, can we do something about it? Can we pre-train nicely? to then improve this fine tuning because the fine tuning will simply overfit, will not really work, will not go far because you don't have enough data to do so, right? So I'm gonna continue. I don't know how long I've been talking already, um, hopefully still okay. So what is meta learning? When we think of standard machine learning, uh, we, we think of them as methods that are actually really good normally at one particular task, but they would require typically retraining for a new task. And so what's the main problem of what I mentioned before, augmentation or pre-training? At the end of the day, the main problem you will find and you will encounter is that they overfit massively the few training data we have. So the model will not have enough data to train. And if you force it, it will just simply overfit. So Keeping in mind that the idea of learning like human, uh, actually humans actually do, the idea is to use an external data set. We assume that we are gonna have some external data that, not, that will not include the particular task we are addressing here and what we want to achieve, but it will help us learn how to learn. And that is the definition of what meta-learning is. The classic definition is learning to learn. If you've learned already how to solve 100 tasks, learning one more shouldn't be as difficult, right? So we will figure it out how to learn more efficiently after having done a hundred tasks that are already out there and for which we do have data. So in this case, actually having multiple tasks is a huge advantage, it's not actually a problem. Um, so essentially, essentially what we're gonna be doing here is using machine learning to improve machine learning, right? We are learning to learn. Um, so meta-learning uses a high-level machine learning algorithm to extract general knowledge about how to make a machine learning process easier and quicker for a range of machine learning tasks. So here in this figure, actually, you see this, right? So you see the grain you send on a neural network saying, hey, I've been here before and it's stuck. What do I do? I'm oscillating, right? So maybe you've seen before how to get rid of that stage, right? So that's the main goal of meta-learning. And if you are very much into deep learning, um, you may be thinking, isn't this quite similar to multitask learning? And indeed it is, right? It, indeed it is, it's quite similar, but you will see that there are a few differences in, in how we proceed, right? So before we go into the detail on how to do machine learning, let's see how to set up the scenario to learn in this fashion, right? When we have very few data and how to, you know, get to do meta learning for future learning. As you will see, they really look, uh, they really work together well. So what we're going to do is we're gonna get some sample data, as I said before, that base class data, right? And what we're going to do is to create with that task that look exactly the same as the task that you want to do at the test phase, right? So which is what we're gonna call meta test. So we're gonna have a meta training phase and a meta test 
phase. The meta training phase consists of learning to learn, learning from tasks that look very much like the one that you're going to be doing at the end. And that means that the number of shots that you've caught, number two, and n equal three, should be the same as what you get in the test phase, right? So we're going to try to learn from this one, then from this one. And the idea is that somehow it will learn in the way that we do as humans, right? So we've seen different tasks, we learned that. You will see actually later that some people actually notice that increasing the number of classes in the training phase of this uh, paradigm, they actually, that actually helps, but sometimes, and it depends on the algorithm itself. So what we are going to do is to build a model based on this support set of the first training task, yeah? And then at each stage of uh, the meta-learning, we update the model parameters based on one of these tasks. And that task, I think it's very important to note that that task is generated and created randomly as you go. So you have that big data set, right? With, which is a multi-class classification data set. And from there, at each step, what you do is to select randomly a task. So at every task, you might be classifying many different things or some classes are a little bit more similar and that depends on what chances, let's say, right? So the, net, the network will be presented with different support sets and then we test them on the query sets. And when testing them in the query set, that is gonna give you some losses, right? It will tell you how well we are doing and that will actually give you the ability to train better in the next step. So basically we're gonna be learning how to learn by doing these small tasks that are similar to the one we have later on, right? So that's what we actually aim to do is how to discriminate data classes in general, not just simply to do it in a particular task, right? So when it comes to test, uh, to the test phase, what you've got um, here is yes, a support set that you're gonna actually use to train. You're gonna train with that. But then that training phase, is with some meta information that you got from the previous meta training stage. And therefore you should be able to learn something even though we've got a very low number of data points. And then we do the query set, which is when we actually test how well we did, right? So it's important to know that many people talk about the test set as this, the test set actually is just this, but this one is not available during the meta training phase. So some people get a little bit confused with the terminology and I should just simply um, say that here, okay? So in summary, in a standard machine learning, what you've got is a number of data instances, right? And what we do is to train just one single learner on that data. And that's what you get. You get the model that is task specific. But in meta learning, we've got a complete different paradigm in which in the meta training phase, what you're given is not data instances, what you're given is a full task, a full machine learning task. What you're going to do is to train a meta learner to learn on each task, right? So each task is a task data. So the data instances for that particular task, you learn a model. You're gonna do that for all of them. And that will help you create a model, a meta learner that given a new task, you can actually be able to produce a model that is actually good enough for that particular task. And that's kind of the goal. And that's why it's general, right? Because it has to learn how to do many things, right? So coming back to uh, the image in particular, um, classification um, problem, the important thing to say here is that it's training on something called an episodic fashion. So at every episode, you're gonna take a few data points from our data set and that will be considered your support and query sets that training and test, right? So we're gonna train on the support set, we're gonna test on the query set. And over a series of episodes, our model should learn something, should learn how to learn from a smaller data set. But what do we learn? And that's kind of the question, right? What we're going to learn is some meta knowledge. You might learn different things depending on the approach. You might learn a good initialization. You might learn a distant metric. You might learn how to augment the data nicely for this particular thing. And when you have that meta knowledge, that's what you pass on to the 
actual learner in here to the future learning actually test. You learn here with that meta knowledge and then you test on there, right? There are many different kind of meta learning uh, approaches. As I said, is you can learn the metric space, you can learn the initialization, you can learn an optimizer and you can do many things uh, like that. So in the literature in future learning, you might find, well, way too many different categorizations of how these methods actually work. Some people talk about black box methods, optimization based, non-parametric and so forth. Here, we talk about three main categories. The first one is called fast parameterization based approaches, which is all about somehow quickly get the method to fine tune well with very few data. So if I remember, if you remember correctly from what I said before, um, I was saying the pre-training is not good, right? Because the initialization is not such a good thing, but there are ways to learn that initialization to make the pre-training worth while, right? By doing meta learning. Um, another set of techniques is all about data generation introdu introduction um, based approaches, right? So basically learning how to augment uh, your data. And some other um, techniques are called metric learning. So what you're trying to learn is, can we define, tailor this metric? Can we learn how to do the comparison between two classes? Well, and you will see that that's actually very straightforward and easy to understand. And that's what I'm going to do in the next 10, 15 minutes. I'm gonna move on onto some canonical examples, right? So I will see, um, I will show you in a minute some of the classic stuff. I'm gonna check the chat if there's any question or anything there. I don't see anything. So yep, people are listening. Good. All right. So canonical example. Um, hopefully you're still awake, so you can still hear me and you're still kind of paying attention. Hopefully you've got coffee. Um, so let's go to metric-based approaches. I think that would be the most straightforward way of doing this, right? So if you were to have this scenario, and this is our training data for that particular task, how will you do this? So let's, let's do K and N, right? So let's do the basic one nearest neighbor. Which one is the most similar in here? But the problem is, well, which distant metric do we use? Do we go pixel space? Do we go L2? Um, how do we compare these two pictures, right? So that's the difficulty. And depending on the classes, that might be different, right? So that's the idea of metric-based uh, approaches, which is comparing the similarities in a learned metric space. I'm not gonna go into the nitty gritty detail, uh, the intuition behind uh, these methods, um, which is all about learning a general feature structure to transform the training and the test sample into embeddings, right? So we're gonna get the embedding and those, uh, well, we'll assign a test embedding. So when we have a test embedding, we just simply compute the nearest neighbor. And, and that would be the simplest way of doing this. There are many methods in this category and they are quite popular. The most simple, simplest thing ever is the CMEs that probably you, you're familiar with and protonet, prototypical networks are kind of the state of the art in metric based uh, approaches. I'm gonna introduce them very, very quickly. What is a CMS uh, network? Well, it's a special type of neural network uh, that is really one of the simplest and one of the most popular at first in one shot learning, but spoiler alert, well, they've been outperformed and no one is actually using them anymore. But having said that, I think they are interesting to understand the idea that we've got here. How do they work? Um, so basically what we're going to do is to have two symmetrical neural nets, both sharing the same weights. Yeah, they have the same weights and the same architecture. And they're both joined together at the end using here some energy function, they call it, right? And the objective is to learn whether two input values are similar or they are not that similar, they are dissimilar, right? So the goal of the network is to generate embedding for the input image and make those embeddings sufficiently different for objects that do not belong to the same class and that should be a zero or this should be a one because they're actually similar. So we are learning how to create that internal representation, that kind of embedding, so that this energy function 
which is no more than a distance metric really a way to compute the similarity that could be euclidean distance or cosine similarity right so you use that to learn how to embed that there right and you're going to put this idea for for it to work in fusion learning is to train the cmes network with all the training tasks right so i show you before that what we do is a meta training phase and then the meta test phase right so in the meta training phase what you're doing is to learn the CMEs network in this pairwise class by class um, distance, right? When you've done that, then in the test, what you have to do is that learn um, network, you use it to extract the features of um, the query set of the images in the test test set. That's, that's a way to say it. And, and then you compare the distance and compute the nearest neighbor. And that's super straightforward. And that doesn't seem to work uh, great in all cases. An alternative to CMEs network that have become really, really a state of the art technique is called Protonet. And Protonet is, stands for, um, yeah, it should be the similarity measure can be something like Euclidean distance or it could be uh, cosine um, distance, um, Eric. So that's what we have in there. Yep. So here, the idea actually is not rocket science, and I really found it funny uh, when the first time I came across this, because the idea is to create a prototyp prototypical representation of a class. And when I thought of that, I was like, isn't that clustering? Or isn't that just a prototype, really, that we've been doing that forever? Uh, but actually, if you read any of the papers in this topic, they will never ever mention the idea of a centroid or anything like that. They, they talk about it like a completely different thing, but it's not. Um, so imagine here in this example, the best way to understand how Protonet works, let's say this is our support set. So here we have uh, N ways, it's three classes, two shot, right? We have two lions, two elephants, and two dogs. And what we're going to do is to learn how to create embeddings like we did before, but rather than just having one single embedding, well, if this is embedding for the lion for this picture, and this is embedding for this picture, the one representing the class lion is the mean prototype of the two. So basically the centroid, if you allow me to, to call it that way. So that's it, right? You do that in, in the meta training phase, basically you're gonna learn how to do this to then classify in the test phase. So again, not rocket science and it's trained in an episodic way. Let me show you with an image how it really works, right? So we're gonna use this episodic training, as I said before, which means we're gonna take one base task. We take it randomly from that external data set. We sample randomly a few data points and they become the training set, right? Our support set and our query set. We got the model that we have so far initialized randomly at first, all the parameters, right? We've got CNN feature extractor, for example, and then we update the parameters based on these images and we classify the test. And that will give you some embedding. Those embeddings, we compute the mean value, right? And they are the representative points. And that um, is used to predict the class. So you're gonna create, if you were to have more than one class, right? You get the embedding. If when you're doing one shot learning, basically you, you only have one, right? And that is just KNM based somehow. You get some meta, meta loss and you use that to update the parameters of the CNN, which is then trained on a different task. And that task again is completely random. And that happens for a number of episodes, right? So that's episode one, two, up to N. At the end of this process, that's when we've done the meta learning. And now we are ready to do the meta testing. That CNN that has learned how to do the feature extraction well, how to improve those meta losses in here to somehow be able to separate better the embeddings, not the embeddings exactly in here, learning how to create that, well, mean prototype representative of each uh, particular class. So hopefully that kind of makes sense to you. Um, so we can, I can show you now a completely different uh, approach. When I say completely still based on meta learning, although by the way, some people don't call this meta learning and don't ask me why, 
which is very much meta learning. But some people say metric learning is not really meta learning because you're well updating as you go. Um, and but the next one is more meta learning based uh, because it really learns the parameter. So the next canonical example I've chosen is called MAMU, model agnostic uh, meta learning. And this one, rather than you know uh, trying to learn that the representation or learning the embedding, what it's trying to learn is what is a good initialization for the parameters, right? So we've got the parameters theta here, right? And this is the way you would do it for multitask learning. But here, what we are aiming to achieve is a parameter and an initialization that would be really good for a number of tasks at the same time. If they are commonly good, as an initialization for multiple tasks that will help you generalize. So what do I mean by that? That is probably uh, not, not so difficult to understand. In a neural network, we're gonna start off with random weights, right? And then train the network by minimizing the loss for which we use gradient descent, right? Looking for the optimal weights that minimize that particular loss. In MAMO, we find the optimal weights by learning from the distribution of similar tasks. They, of course, need to be um, similar, right? So imagine we've got three different but related tasks and we train a network on the first task, task right? Using these random weights to obtain an optimal set of parameters from the models with that task, right? We do the same for task two and task three. And at the end, what we're gonna get is from that random initialization, right? We got to a point and for uh, the three of them. So instead of initializing theta randomly, what we're going to try to do is to find that common theta for the three tasks. What was closer to this, this point in here represented in this figure, what is closer to the three of them? So that then in the fine tuning stage in that particular task, you're closer. So basically we are trying to address the problem of pre-training for future learning. We are actually trying to learn how to deal with multiple tasks and how to come up with a good initialization for multiple tasks. MAMU is actually used a lot, not only in future learning, but also in range formal learning because of its ability to initialize uh, the parameters. Let me show you a little bit more detail. I don't want to bore you with detail about how it actually works. So we're gonna start off initializing randomly the parameters of your model, right? Whatever that model is, let's say CNN based, right? So we sample some task, um, and remember what the task is, right? It's a support set with K shots and N classes, right? But we're gonna get actually not one, but let's say three different tasks. For each one of them, we create the support and query sets. As I said, and I think I'm repeating myself a little bit too, ma too many times, but the idea is that you need to do that randomly as you go. They're not prefixed. And that's something it took me a, a bit of time to learn or to understand because in machine learning traditionally, you've got your train, you've got your test, and that's not something you change. Um, but in, in future learning, you create them as you go. Then you train a model on that support set. And that will give you some parameters theta i, right? But then the next thing is, okay, okay, let's calculate the gradient with respect to optimal parameters theta on the query sets for the three tasks we've got there. And using that, we can update the parameters, right, of that meta model in there. And we're gonna repeat that for a number of episodes, a number of uh, iterations. And that's how uh, it works, this MAMO thing. So at the end of the day, when you finish this meta training, the value of theta has learned how to be good for more than one task. And then when you go to the meta test, which is a complete new task, it should be good enough as an initialization, right? So different from the metric learning, here we are, well, basically learning a different kind of meta knowledge, meta -knowledge right? We are learning just the initialization. So hopefully, um, I think we started a little bit late, but I think I still have a few minutes uh, to talk a little bit about the contributions we've done so far uh, in the future learning, um, let's say, field. Um, I needed all of these talks, I've been uh, talking no, uh, nonstop to be able to give you a bit of a flavor of why we do what we do, right? Because if I were to introduce directly the methods, you probably wouldn't understand anything at all. So hopefully that was kind of clear. You kind of follow me, you can also remember 
um, that terminology. So what are the two main issues we have when we talk about future learning? Obviously, from everything I said before, is the lack of information. We have very little amount of data, and therefore, it's just difficult to learn, right? Because we're going to overfit. And all the methods you've seen before, the idea of mean uh, prototypes from ProtoNet or the idea of MAMO of, you know, generalizing that kind of initialization or learning how to initialize, is all about dealing with the lack of information. But there is something important about future learning is that the uncertainty you've got in the images that you get given to classify, many of them are not very representative examples. And that really bothered me when I, when I, fir when I first started learning about future learning. For example, is that dog looking backwards representative of that kind of dog? No, it's not, right? And a different thing that also really bothered me a lot is what we call background clusters. So in the background of an image, well, that background could be very similar for multiple classes, which is a bit of a, well, a bit of an issue because if you've got the exactly same background for complete different objects and the object is not that big in the image, well, the neural network might actually get confused, right? So imagine that you've got some pictures of a cat and a dog and, and, and a lion in, in the lawn and in, in the grass or, or in the sea or whatever, they're gonna look all the same, right? So the idea is, can we do something about that um, uncertainty? If you look at the method existing in future learning, and you look again at the three categories I mentioned before, they do not normally consider both things at the same time. They're either just focusing on that lack of information and trying to generate more, or trying to you know, optimize like MAMO, optimize that initial parameter, which is good for the lack of information to do it more efficiently, or they actually deal with the uncertainty, let's say, trying to come back to come back to, to come up with some embeddings actually that are good and representative of that particular class. But very, very fewer, just a few papers introducing auxiliary information were actually dealing with both issues at the same time. And that's kind of our goal. And what we noticed in that kind of work is that they were not really thorough. So that was kind of our, well, motivation for us uh, to, to do that. Yep, so that's, that's the whole thing. We're gonna try to learn how to remove the background, but we're not gonna learn, we're actually gonna use stuff that are already available there uh, to try to see that helps to mitigate the impact of having you know, those backgrounds and, and that clutter uh, background in there, right? So the idea of the whole PhD of my student, uh, Heda Song, was to mitigate the intrinsic uncertainties and overcome the lack of information from different perspectives. The first one was, can we actually maximize the use of the training samples? We've got what we've got. Can we do something about it? Can we somehow remove the negative influence of unrepresentative sample? And can we, as much as possible, leverage the useful information existing in those very little samples, right? So I will show you how we've done this, which is all about learning how to aggregate embeddings. And then the next, objective was, okay, the feature extraction process seems to be a very important process in future learning, especially for metric-based uh, approaches, for example, they rely on the embedding, but they do not care much about how that feature extraction process happened. And so what we've been thinking is, can we avoid losing any useful information? Can we diminish the impact of those background clusters, right? So we're gonna try to do so in objective two of this work. And last but not least, uh, the last objective was all about using auxiliary information. And I will show you what kind of auxiliary information we investigated and we were trying to see which ones were beneficial to mitigate that influence, right? So these are, let's say, two main objectives is to deal with these two. And then we've done it step by step in a progressive way within a normal PhD project, let's say. Mm. So we don't have uh, much time. So I'm gonna try to, you know, somehow walk quickly, but at the same time, try to give you a bit of a, um, well, an, an idea of why, um, why we did what we did, right? So if we go back to ProtonNet, what do you think is the effect of having any outliers? 
if you remember ProtonNet, I told you that's kind of a clustering thing, right? So it's just basically trying to get that mean prototype of um, a class. If you were to be thinking of class blue in here, this guy here with the dashed um, square, let's say, that's an outlier. And that outlier will put that centroid, that mean prototype, way farther than it should be if we do not consider this. Same happens to this class of red, right? So it's the thing that we might want to deal with, kind of removing the negative influence of unrepresentative examples, right? So if you think of the effect on ProtonNet, you will see that basically changes the prototypes, right? So you might be thinking, oh, well, if I do some sort of attention mechanism, will help to really not paying attention to this one, right? And you're right, but you would be missing something here, which is what we believe is, is kind of the key, right? To be able to take the most out of uh, all the data you've got. So in the most string case uh, for one short task, well, there's only one training sample and we cannot aggregate anything. We cannot do much, right? And, and what happens is they just simply, typically in the literature, they just simply take what they have and they don't care, right? Um, but what we argue here is that there are some beneficial information from other classes that could be used to strengthen one class representation. What do I mean by that? Look, in here, we've got a four-way one-shot learning. Four classes, blue, red, yellow, green, and we've got four different prototypes, right? Because we basically have one shot learning. But what you might see inside of that kind of a square is the feature maps, the feature embeddings of that particular sample. And what you might notice is that this is green and this is green, this is yellow and yellow. And what is that is representing is that the information is not that different. For example, if you were to be thinking of a bird or different kind of birds, maybe in the embedding, they're actually not that different. And what we believe is we could use information from other, um, from other classes to strengthen the representation of one single prototype. And I will show you later how we did that. So what we propose is a method that we call learning to aggregate embeddings with meta-level dropout. The meta-level dropout was kind of a coincidence that we learned, uh, but it's basically a meta-learning approach for few shot image classification that is going to learn how to aggregate embeddings with this kind of meta-level dropout, right? So it's learning a CNN feature structure, feature structure, sorry, and a channel-wise attention mechanism in an end-to-end -end manner. Basically, we are trying to learn, well, how do we use everything we have with that attention mechanism? So the main contribution is a module that's called an attention uh, mechanism module. So the feature structure is typically used to transform the input image into discriminative embeddings, right? So the channel-wise attention mechanism is learned to assign larger weights to useful feature maps. But we're not just assigning weights to the entire prototype, but we're actually assigning weights to parts of the feature embeddings, right? That's kind of the main noticeable difference with standard attention mechanisms approaches for, for this, right? And so what we, plan to do here, what we decided to do here is to do so, unfortunately, slightly differently for one shot and few shot learning tasks because we couldn't do exactly the same thing, but with the same underlying idea. Um, I did mention this meta-level dropout, which we found really strange that no one actually considered the use of dropout for the meta-training uh, phase. And now we actually showed in, in the paper that, well, it, do, it does actually help massively um, with, with the results. But that's kind of a, well, an extra um, contribution we, we've got. So in a nutshell, how do we deal with k shot? Let's say we've got five shot of this particular dog, right? And we've got the embedding model, which is a CNN, for example, to extract some features. And what we do here is the attention module. That is used for generating aggregation weights of the feature maps on that particular um, um, sample, right? So we're gonna somehow take all of the examples together. We're gonna give them and aggregate the embeddings of all of them at once, right? When we've got one shot, 
we do it actually in a very similar way. Here, we are trying to distinguish um, what this is, is a bird, right? And we've got only a picture of a bird. We've got a, what do you say, is this a duck or a goose, let's say, a bath, a crab, and a jellyfish. And what we argue here is that in many cases, you might find classes like this too, that they somehow are related, right? A bird and a goose are more similar than a bus, right? So if we actually use information from here to strengthen this one, it will help distinguish these two against the other ones. And that's kind of the whole idea underneath this, and that's what we use. I'm not gonna have the time to really go into the detail, but that's kind of what we do and um, we tested this on a number of data sets that are traditional for future learning, classification, image classification, only glot and mini image net. And here you can see some of the results we've got. Not gonna have time to detail everything here. The first experiment you see is a very stupid experiment just showing the influence of using dropout or not in standard um, future learning approaches versus our approach, right? And in here, you see another set of results comparing one shot versus five shot learning in five ways. So five classes, one shot, yeah? And here you can see, well, we do quite well in five shot. We didn't do great or at least not the best in one shot learning in particular, right? So for this particular uh, setting. The way it is trained is actually really confusing if you're not used to few shot learning um, and you will see all the details, but we just basically follow the traditional way of doing so in an episodic training. If you've got more questions about it, I'm happy to, to take any questions um, later on. Second work is all about, so far we took care a little bit of um, using the limited training data we've got, but we didn't really pay attention to avoiding losing information. And what I mean by that is that typically in future learning, something we notice in the literature is that they employ a simply normal CNN block. And that is a convolution operation, a batch normalization, an activation function, and a downsampling operation. And everybody just took for granted that in future learning, max pooling or an average pooling that should work, right? And the simple idea behind this objective was, can we do something more adaptive can we do something more learn for the, this particular setting on future learning? And that's what we do. Basically, for each convolutional, uh, let's say, layer, we're going to add in a module that we call adaptive pooling module. The good thing about this is that this can be integrated in any future learning method that is based on feature structures, which is basically all of them, uh, or most of them, right? So. By doing so, what we are learning is how to do the pooling, how to do it more effectively to somehow mitigate a little bit uh, the effect of, um, well, let's say background clutters, but also how to pay more attention in the space of the image to what we wanted to pay more attention. Um, I don't really have the time to, to work through it, but just wanted to show you a set of results in which you can see that compared to a great number of different pooling operations, we demonstrated that the use of this adaptive pooling was always, always beneficial. And we integrated that into a number of future learning approaches like MAMO, uh, like Protonet and so forth. And we always consistently, we got a good improvement of the results. We never got the decrease. So it means that doing this pooling operation differently and learning how to do that pooling is a good idea. That was, a, let's say, a small contribution, but was consistent. And the last objective, and with this, I will uh, finish the presentation, was about using um, some auxiliary information. For me, because I come from a data pre-processing background, for me, when my student was talking to me about future learning, I was like, I really hate those uh, background clutters. We need to do something about it. Um, so I. We, we were looking at what people did in the literature and some people use bounding boxes or saliency maps, but they didn't really explore how that affects many different methods. And they didn't really explore, let's say in a comprehensive way, what is the suitability of that different auxiliary information, how to use that auxiliary information in detail, because there might be different ways of doing so. Briefly, um, so what I wanted to tell you is that there are different three, well, three different kind of auxiliary information we are considering in this work. And they, are, they all come from the computer vision 
uh, feel, let's say. So we wanted to look at edges. What are edges in here? Are points at which the image brightness changes sharply, right? So when you see that, you kind of see a little bit of the shape of that, right? When it changes sharply in brightness. Bounded boxes just basically tells you where, let's say the main target object is in the image and saliency maps are very much to determine what is the foreground versus the background of the image. So these are always black and white. We use here that auxiliary information. We are gonna use that to try to improve the future learning task. Something important to mention is that we do use a predefined algorithm for edges or pre-trained models for bounding boxes and saliency maps. Yet, so we're not trying to learn those. We're trying to learn how to exploit them in the future learning scenario. So, and how do we use that information? So we found four different ways of doing so. Because we have black and white images with these edges or bounding box or saliency map, the most standard way of doing this is, okay, let's add that information as an additional channel, as simple as that, right? Red, uh, red green, blue, and that extra saliency map or bounding box and so forth. Another option, uh, well, the good thing about that is that, I mean, honestly, we don't have to change anything in the future learning um, approach. We just simply have one extra channel, end of the story, right? So we don't have to do much and it's simple. Um, to remove the background, right? So we need to incorporate that auxiliary information. Um, the problem is you couldn't use edges for that because they don't really define what the background is, right? So we could use um, only just, let's say, bounding boxes, and that would be what you input. You have to remove all of these black pixels in here, right? Or you do it based on saliency maps. So the input to the image is now this, which is different, right? So this is two approaches. The other two approaches we quickly investigated as well. Um, is using the respective feature structures, right? What does it actually mean? So rather than putting that as a channel, we're gonna keep that in a separate way, let's say through the convolution. So when we get the final embedding, it's the aggregation of this and this. So somehow we are thinking that maybe this through the convolutions, if we were to use it in this fashion, let's say an additional channel, that information might be lost. And the last one, we call it multitask learning based on um, UNET. Um, and basically it's kind of a similar idea to this one based on multitask uh, learning that, well, basically go stage by stage and try to see if you can have that predicted uh, saliency map. I don't really have the time to, to cover details. I don't think they are super interesting, but just to give you a flavor of what we did and what we, had at the end when with all of these experiments in here, A, B, C, D are basically the three, the four approaches, sorry, that we cover here, additional channel, removing background, using the respective feature structures, let's say feature structures for one here and a different one for, for the original image and the multitask approach using different inputs, right? So the edges or using the bounding box or the saliency map. And what you see here is consistently normally the best approach is to learn a feature structure specifically for saliency maps. And that really works really well on this protonet method. When we put everything together, and with this, I'm gonna finish. When we put everything together, what you see is, this is the first paper we did, learning to aggregate embeddings plus, the pooling plus, using the saliency that I mentioned before, right? With feature structure, we do get state-of-the-art results compared to everything you see in the literature until 2022, of course. And I can tell you in this crazy field of future learning, you see a new method coming up every single day. So it's a little bit challenging. Quick uh, set of conclusions here, take home message. I believe it's a very interesting approach to facilitate that kind of more general use of machine learning and AI. It's challenging, it's confusing, and I give you that, um, but there is a lot of things to do here when it comes down to understanding the influence of the lack of data and the uncertainty in the data. So there is a lot of work to do. And something I noticed is that many of the words that you find in future, future image classification, they come from pure computer vision, 
some ideas are so different from what we do in machine learning. And I actually think some of the ideas are wrong. And I think we have many things we can do better at establishing, for example, some uh, experimental frameworks and so forth. What I would like to do in the future in this kind of research work is the use of future learning for image segmentation, for example. I'm very interested in the idea of meta learning, auto machine learning, where it comes down to really big data sets and um, trying to understand the interpretability of such a challenging method. With this, I'm gonna say goodbye. I had one more slide about the project we did, but I'm gonna say thank you. And if you have any questions, I would be more than happy to answer them. Is anyone there? Thank you very much, Isaac, for your nice presentation and instructive presentation. Now it's time uh, for our uh, for, uh, uh, for the people if they want to make any question to our uh, speaker. So we can proceed as uh, we do. Uh, if uh, somebody wants to make a question, can uh, say something in the in the chat or open the the microphone and speak. I'm going to see the chat if they, I see uh, a questions by Eric, Eric Manibardo. I can, I can, Eric? I, yeah, that question come from before when I was talking about uh, okay, well, removing, removing the background. Okay, so I think somehow chat. I addressed that, but if not, Eric, please let me know. Questions? <coughs> Was it so boring that no one has any questions? Uh, hello, Isaac. Hello, hello. Uh, thank you very much for for your presentation. It was very very good. I I didn't, I didn't hope to learn that, that much in that presentation, but I I have to say it was very instructive and easy to to understand. So thank you. Thank you. Go computing. I don't know who you are. But I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I had to change my my account. Uh, and, stuff uh, uh computer stuff uh sorry my question will be um during the, the training the training steps of the algorithm you explained uh about uh support and and query query query, query uh, yeah, sub, sub data set uh, -huh. uh do you always train with the same number of classes in each uh Training step, or do you change the number of classes, the classes itself, the the, the classes subset, or yep. do you take a classes subset? So typically, you should keep exactly the same, right? So if here you have five classes, right? So it should be the same that you expect in the meta test phase, right? Whenever you actually want to solve the task and you really want to solve from the very beginning. But what happens is some people have found that actually increasing the number of classes instead of five in the training, you were to have 10, then normally you would think that would make things more difficult. It could help. When it helps, especially for anything like ProtoNet, which is creating an embedding. So an embedding is just a class representative, right? If you use more classes, you're learning how to create more representative of different classes, right? So it helps with that somehow extracting or learning how to extract features, sorry, from different classes. So that helps. And then if you read the paper of ProtoNet in here, you will see that they tell you exactly that. When training, they increase the number of classes to a number way higher than what you have at the test, meta test phase. But normally you should keep it the same. And the whole thing about meta learning is, okay, let's mimic exactly how we did it in the in how, how we need to do it in the test but sometimes it's it's more advantageous right yes so d during the test what, what would you like to do is to add not just uh, for example two three four classes uh, you don't know the number of classes you know to uh, you want to add to, to and, in our real right. life yeah. environment yeah in, in a real 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 life environment you don't even know that do you uh but that, that's right but that somehow, I mean, this is still limited, right? So somehow you're defining a problem. Imagine that you have a particular problem that you, you want to address, right? And you don't have enough data. For example, in the project that I'm, uh, I don't want to go so slow, but in the project I've been 
uh, I did for an application, we were trying to classify five classes, right? We knew already that. The problem is we didn't have enough pictures of kids because they were just newborns and we needed to have pictures of their feet and their ears and their head. And you don't normally get pictures of kids, newborns, right? Because you're, you're not allowed to get that kind of picture. So we knew what we wanted to do. And learning in that reduced number of points is just difficult. Then is when you can set up your meta learning in the exactly same way. So somehow you're not, we're not at that point yet. That, that is, it is a great question. We're not at that point yet that we meta train freely to then we will see what we have in the meta phase, right? We're not quite there yet. We need to do the meta training somehow similar to what we already know what the task is. Make sense? Oh, yes, thank so you. We, we're not that yet to make it so general, if that makes sense. It's not that, yes. that general. So maybe we need a meta, meta, meta learning approach. <laughs> uh, learning about learning about learning, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Learning cubic, I don't know how to call it. <laughs> so. So thank you very much for answering. Thank you. I have a question, Eugenio. Go for it. May I? <laughs> Thanks, Isaac, for your talk. It was so nice. So maybe this is a pretty naive. It's just the opposite. So I, I, I'm thinking about maybe it's a very stupid question. So sorry, because, you know, I'm not an expert on this. But my, my question is just the opposite. So what I think is that you are playing with a data set. So think about that you are applying a few shot learning approach to a classical uh, image classification data set. Mm -hmm. Would it be he helpful? So what I wonder is that at the end you are, you have your data set and you are making combination of the support and the query data set. Mm -hmm. So that, that could be a different way of doing classical image classification, classical machine learning, on a classical problem and you are doing episodic learning and you are doing uh, adding diversity and you are trying to identify these underrepresented techniques and so on would it be fees well feasible it, feasible it's it actually is. feasible but but would it be helpful to solve the problem even if you have a, a large number of uh, of data items and so on you're very mean, Oscar uh, with that question i mean it's difficult to say i haven't done the experiment right so i wouldn't know exactly how it would behave. What I can tell you, my intuition behind that is not every method would work, of course. Anything like MAML, that one that was learning that good initialization, I don't think it makes much sense. But maybe something like metric learning could make some sense. When I would do that is when in your data set, what you normally end up having is a massive overfitting. When you do have overfitting, I think few shot and the idea of meta learning, let's say, it would work because that's Everything here is to deal with overfitting, right? To, to be able to learn from nothing. In those cases, maybe there is a point in doing this kind of weird training to address a traditional classification problem. But I don't think I've seen, an, I've never seen anything like that in the literature. So maybe you want to write the paper on this and, and, and we make fun of, of it. And I can actually, the main problem is then the evaluation, how you, how you do it, I guess. What you do is you do this episodic training and then the test itself, you don't do it. You basically just have the network and you retrain with all the data and, and see what happens in the normal test. I never done anything like that. So I wouldn't know. <laughs> and Perfect. then- I, I told you it was pretty naive. <laughs> the, the, the problem I see as well is supposedly what you have, the classes you've got here should never be in this phase, right? So how do you do it in a traditional setting? So, I mean, I'm sure we could use the idea of episodic training to learn in a slightly different way, but I'm not sure it will really change what you learn as much. Maybe an expert here like Pablo could tell us because they know more about deep learning. So I don't know if, if you want to jump in, Pablo, if you're here. Oh, he's not, or I don't see him. Thanks. Thank you, Oscar. Thanks, Oscar. Any more questions? <clears throat> yeah, uh, um, ah, Jose Luna. Uh, 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 Jose Luna hello. says. Ah, sorry. Yeah, uh, I have one question. Go for it. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, because uh, I have a similar question, like a uh, uh, another one, a question. <coughs> you said uh, it's a few shot 
the learning. Mm -hmm. But uh, really, you have a lot of tasks, and each task you have a lot of short you know, training set. So mm -hmm. finally, if you create one accurate model, can recognize the different uh, image, maybe you need the same quantity of the photos, the image, yep. like the normal training. So finally, it's not really feel short. Yep. So you need to mimic that. So that's exactly the point, right? What you see in this image, that's what you do, right? You have five classes here. Yes. And one shot. So that means one picture of each class. And that's what you should have in every task. And then you learn a network with this and you test on this. And what, with the knowledge that you've got, how well you did that, you move to the next, to the next yeah. task, right? And at the end of this process, you have that kind of network that knows a little bit of how to learn in this setting. So what you're learning is really how to distinguish in this particular setting. A different thing is that sometimes you can enlarge the number of classes and that might be beneficial, but that's a particular thing for a particular method, really. That's what I was telling before to go computing that I still don't know who they are. And <laughs> is, that, is that answering your question? So you mean uh, we will uh, this learning will not reduce the the data set? No, it is only another way to do the training. Yeah, it's just another way of doing the training. So we're using some external data set to do pre-training, right? But the pre-training is not done as a normal pre-training because if you were to do standard pre-training, like um, that's what I was trying to show you here. If I get there ever here, that's the let's say big data set you might have available yeah. from similar tasks, right? If you were to yeah. learn this way only, that network that you might have learned or any method really, they haven't learned how to learn. They have learned some information about classes and, and how to distinguish them. So they don't really help. They are okay. I mean, they, they always put this as a baseline. So the baseline is I learn with everything I have, with ResNet or whatever you want, right? And then you use yeah. that as a pre-training for my task, which is more limited, which is different. It helps, of course it helps compared to not doing anything at all, not doing pre-training, but because they don't do that kind of mimicking how the future learning task is, they do not perform as well, if that makes sense. So the kind of partitioning the same way is really needed. Okay, okay. Now I understand more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Reed. Uh, Isaac, we have a uh, writing question mm -hmm. by uh, Jose Luna. Um, I'm happy to read it. I can uh, read it. Or I, can, I can read it and answer. That's fine. Um, okay. Let me get to, I'm going to directly get to a slide in which I can tell him. So, I think I forgot actually to say it, but this one in particular. So the question from Jose is, is, is any of the methods I presented today here able to do zero short learning? Um, they do, right? And not all of them, but ProtonNet, for example, would be okay. If you give it the embedding, which would be that meta information, you would be able to do that, right? I don't know, that depends a lot on the context, right? Because it depends on what the meta information is, but they are ready to do, um, let's say, few shot learning, zero shot learning. If you were to have that kind of class prototype, which is not the input data you've got, right? So you don't have anything, you simply have an embedding, for example, if that makes sense. But you can get that embedding from other information, I guess. I haven't read a lot about zero shot learning to, to know exactly, but it does work with ProtonNet and everything we did would work for zero shot learning as well. With Mamu, I think they don't work as easily, but they do as well. Hopefully that answers your question. But they, they do, I, I don't know, I, I don't have experience enough, Jose, to know how well they do in zero shot learning. So I haven't really tested myself, so I wouldn't dare to say. I know kind of the principle how zero shot learning works, but I haven't really run them in there. Thanks, Isaac. We have, okay, Jose said you okay, thanks. 
So any more questions? So we can start thinking to finishing uh, the tutorial. So if we don't have any more questions, I've lost 10 people, so they got bored. No, no, okay. But pa pa Paco is there. I don't know if he's listening, but Paco is there, so hey. Uh, so, may yeah. I ask uh, one, another question? Sure, go for it. Okay, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I don't know if you, did, did you say that, but uh, uh, can we somehow to uh, predict uh, if some class is a new class uh, i mean if the model is able to to detect that there, there, this is not an example of the example we we gave in the in the few short learning not not per se so no one is considering that particular let's say case right in which you are trying to classify something that you didn't train with right so if you go back if we go back to the training model in meta training um let me see if I find it quickly. There you go. So here you're expecting that whatever you're training with in the test, you're gonna get the same classes. You're not expecting here uh, a cat because there are no cats here, right? Normally not. I mean, maybe that's a different topic, right? But not in future, not in a standard future learning to the best of my knowledge. So do, do you think uh, in your personal opinion, is the, is that possible because with a few samples of some some data uh, you can't get a, a real distribution of that uh, object or... i mean what it, what i think would happen is you give here you here provide now a class you, you provide this picture right yeah. so the embedding will be created and it will try to find the nearest neighbor a very simple way of deciding is the yeah. space on yes. the, they are very far. So they are very far. If you put a threshold or something like that, you say unable to classify. I guess that's the way I would do it. <laughs> unable to classify, it's too far. Mm. But, but if not, it's gonna be given the neatest one. So if you give that bird, I don't know which one is the neatest, maybe the, the dog, <laughs> and it will say it's a dog. So <laughs> it's very stupid, right? So you, but they are not considered in that case, again, in practice, they are just considering cases in which you do know what you want to do, but you have very few data. So instead of pre-training, you need to do it slightly differently. That's the whole, the whole point. But yeah, yes. yeah. That's a, I mean, maybe we need to go in that direction, try to trick the system and stuff like that. <laughs> and <laughs> maybe, maybe would... There are papers about things like that, for sure. And oh, yes. it's a very, very active community, especially in CVPR, ICML. Uh, conferences you see few shot learning papers coming out every every time and really good papers probably i'll pay attention thank you very much You're welcome carlos now i know your name <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much carlos um i think it's time to finish in, uh, to finish our uh webin that's the webinar uh it's time to say again thank you isaac for for accepting this Im this invitation and thank you again for illustrating us about uh, fuse of learning that uh, we are convinced that uh, it's a real, not challenge, but now trend in artificial intelligence. So thank you very much, uh, Isaac. Thank you. Thank you everyone thank you. for joining me today. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you.